here I am, um, face to face over the internet with uh, Jason Watkins, who's very kindly agreed to come and have a chat with us today. Um, Jason, um, firstly, I was looking at your CV, obviously doing my homework, and not only is it an extensive CV, but it's incredibly varied. You seem to have avoided the the problem of, of typecasting. How have you done that in your career? Um, I don't know, really. I think it's. Uh, I don't think I'm ever going to play a leading man. Although I have a couple of times done that, which is uh, with varying degrees of success. But um, I think. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is to do with my background. Um, we were talking before, just as we met there, about you know where where I'm from in the UK. You know, I'm, I was born in the Midlands, um, not far from where you're speaking now, and then uh, brought up in West London. And my parents are from the north. I still have lots of family in the north, so my sort of natural sound is quite varied in itself. And um, yeah, I think a, a lot of it a lot of it comes from that. Um, and I've always been really good at mimicking and imitating. I mean, I started when I used to play cricket. I used to play a lot of cricket, a lot of sport. And I ended up when I was about 16, 15, 16, impersonating the whole of my cricket team. So I'd do it in the bar after the get after the games. It was my sort of party piece. So I've always been able to be a mimic, and I've always done uh, had an ear for accents. And I think I started out doing a lot of theatre and the, that's where you're sort of employed. You can be employed to do all sorts of things. So, uh, and often in one play, you know, you'd be playing two or diff three different characters. So it kind of has grown out of that and kind of kept going. Interesting. I, I noticed that you trained at RADA. Yeah. Which uh, also has a reputation for a very, very traditional drama school. You as a middler, Midlander going to that school, did they try and get the accent out of you? No, I think at the time, I was in a very good year. We had, uh, you know, Ray Fiennes, Ian Glenn, Jane Horrocks, uh, Imogen Stubbs, uh, Neil Dudgeon. I mean, it was a really varied, uh, very, very varied year, and it very, ended up being a very successful year. And, you know, Jane, Jane Horrocks, you know, she's got a very, you know, distinctive accent, and where she's from, in Bur you know, near Burnley, and her, the, you know, Rossendale Valley. No, so that was never sort of beaten out of her. And I think we were just at the time when drama schools were understanding that it was good to have a neutral voice. You say you could speak as a neutral and not be seen as being in a particular place. But it also understood the value of regional accents and how, particularly in television, how they were being used and how different ways of living and different lives and different parts of the UK were beginning to be more represented, particularly through television. And that really has continued, you know, uh, from, from with, you know, there's been arguments about there being uh, recently about not being enough voices from the regions and how difficult it is for actors from, uh, from not particularly affluent backgrounds to support their careers early on. But, you know, that, that's another argument, but I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, Rada was a Rada was a great place to study. I, I mean, I I I did a post recently about I, I'm dyslexic. So I had terrible reading problems when I was a kid uh, uh, in my schooling, and you know, thought that I wasn't you know thought I was a bit thick and you know, all that, and I, I never thought that. But I just thought the academic life was not for me. So when I went to Rada, it, weirdly, although it was a practical course, it was about acting. I actually started to understand literature and really be able to get my head around it and take the time to read and I started reading books which is quite painful for me then I think so yeah it was a great mixture and fantastic people great characters and you know wonderful staff and some staff from the old school you know Madame Fedra and these ballet dance teachers and all that and you know newer newer sort of newer minds and uh, yeah it was it was a great time. How did you cope with the, the sight reading side of being drama school and auditions, because that must have been quite um, intimidating, yeah. actually. Yeah, terrifying. I mean, I've, uh, I've, just, I've just read Barnaby Rudge for Audible um, uh, last year, about this time last year, uh, and you can get it. It's, uh, and it's one of the most amazing, amazing books. I mean, it's a staggeringly brilliant book. Uh, and it took me about, um, I think we did probably about 30 five days in total 
and uh, it was a real struggle for me to, and we ended up, which is often happens, you re-record the first couple of chapters. So you, once you're in your stride into the mid, middle of the book, you can go back and pick up and then you've got this. So for me, with my difficulties, yeah, yes. I, I, I re recently learned that Zoe Wanamaker has problems with sight reading and has a dyslexic issue. And yeah, it's particularly early on in my career, it was very challenging and I remember read-throughs at Out of Joint, you know, and at the Royal Court, where I did a lot of theatre and at the RSC, where it was really, you know, maybe embarrassing isn't the right word because I think people are supportive, but it, it, it's hard when you're just guess. occasionally when you're nervous, you're guessing at words and you're almost pitching what you think the word might be and it might make sense, but it might not be the one on the page. And that's very hard, but I've learned over, over my career to, be able to temper that and be able to uh, find my way through it. But for younger actors, you know, they've got to remember that that's only one part of the process. What you've got to do, you're on stage or in front of the camera, that's a different thing altogether. And by then, you kind of know what you're doing, you're on top of it. And for me, it's helped me because I've, when I'm particularly improvising, I love improvising, and that's something that is non, not defined by a text. Uh, and when with things like The Crown, which is great, very rich in terms of the, you know, by the time you're filming, you're so on top of it and it becomes your own, you own it. It's not, it's not on the page anymore, you own it. And I think that's been a product of my reading difficulties. You've just mentioned The Crown, so I'll, I'll pursue that if you don't mind. This. Mm -hmm. um, you played uh, Harold Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Now, earlier on in the series, The Crown, the actors were portraying characters who don't exist on on video and the recording, so they have a bit more freedom. But there must be a lot of pressure to get that performance physically and correct, really. Historically correct. Yeah, 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 I mean, there is. I mean, there's so much, uh, it's one of the things, it's so, there's so much visual imagery and so much, so many references of, of him. And he was a prime minister who was the first person that understood. I mean, he was, although he didn't look like him, didn't come across as someone like JFK. <laughs> he didn't kind of, so kind of the different end of the sexy scale, perhaps. And maybe oh, that's unfair. I kind of say that, but um, uh, you know, he uh, he understood the power of television, and so he pursued that. And Tony Benn, who's you know became a great uh, parliamentarian and diarist, at the, he had him in his cabinet. And Tony Benn was, in fact, had come from television, believe it or not. Um, and so he understood. So he had people close to him, so he was able to communicate well. And he himself got better and used more of his own natural sense of humor and personality than, uh, as he began to use TV more and more. So, um, I, yes, yeah, so there is a lot, which is, which is fantastic because you can do like with the, um, uh, you know, the pound in your pocket speech, which we do, it's all there, every mannerism and, you know, and you, you try and do all of them. So there's a pressure in that you want to, you want it to be, seem to be mimicking him well enough but it's also it gives you what you need if you can if you can look now i think the first time i became aware of of seeing you on screen i must have seen you other things but when i really became aware of the character you were playing regularly was in being human yeah fantastic yeah. series now yeah. um obviously well really well received at the time and very well regarded but when you first heard about this comedy, drama, monster flat share. What were your first impressions of that unique idea? Such a brilliant script. I mean, it started, started life, Toby Whithouse, the writer, I mean, it's, and, uh, it started life as uh, a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I think a sex addict, uh, trying to, you know, say cure themselves, but trying to be able to handle their addictions. So I had this kind of reality to it. And it was, it was before the twilight, it came out and was made before the Twilight movies. And it, some bright spark in the uh, production and the, the production company thought, one of the producers, well, let's just genre it up. Let's make, you know, the, uh, the sex addict a vampire. Let's make the alcoholic, a, you know, a alcoholic or, you know. And, and so um, that was where it came from. So it always had the kind of element of truth to it, even though it was this... Uh, great uh kind of you know genre piece you know brilliant performance by Aidan Turner and the Rustovian snake you know and you know I mean 
it was just uh, uh, and Leonora Critchlow. I mean, it was the most good, good performances, great director. So oh, it all worked. And my guy, I just played a part of the National Theatre. I played an SIS officer, you know, played a, um, I played a secret intelligence officer who, who in a play by um, Joe Pennell, who went on to do Mindhunter, amongst many other things. Still waiting for the call on that one, actually. But um, he, uh, I'm not sure they're making money more, actually, but what a brilliant, brilliant series that is and well worth looking at. And Joe is a brilliant writer, brilliant, brilliant writer. And uh, so I played this guy and I read the script. I thought, hang about, there's this villain uh, who's like the nicest guy that you've ever met in your life, which was kind of the part that I was playing at the National. This guy was trying to persuade Tom Hollander to give up this invention that he'd, he'd made for, it was a weapon, it's called Landscape with Weapon, and Tom's character had invented a weapon that the MOD wanted the rights to, and he wasn't going to give them up. So I had to go over and persuade him to give over the intellectual property rights of his weapon. So I kind of pushed that into the audition side. So I remember turning up doing it, and a cup of coffee, and turning it, and they were very quiet. They didn't really say much. Oh, God, maybe they, just, they don't really want me here. I'm just a sort of filling, you know. Uh, and I sort of did it. And said, thank you very much. And that was it. It was a very perfunctory, but I got it sort of, I think the next day or even later on that day, I think they were convinced. So, yeah, yeah, that was sort of where it came from. This just lovely guy who would actually rip your heart out. Literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I mean, what, what a gift for any actor to play a, a vampire king, essentially. A sort of mafia yeah. vampire leader. Just an absolute joy for you. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was horrendous. I mean, he was absolutely horrendous. Uh, and yeah, they're great. You're, you're very unburdened by kind of, it's all about, I think they're always about appetite. Those kind of villains. It's not as, it's as much, it's not about playing evil, it's about appetite. And once you work out what it is that they want from the victims, that's, it's about hurting them and owning them, but it's also about the enjoyment you get from doing that. So yeah, it's pretty nasty, murky stuff. But fuck, terribly fun. Yeah. Now, another role, complete contrast. I first talked to you about Are You Being Served? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, if I remember rightly, it was, a, it was a pilot. Was it one of six pilots? It was, it was one of... There's, there'd been a, you know, been a tradition of... I did a thing called Fear of Fanny about Fanny Craddock, uh, with Julia Davis playing Fanny Craddock and Mark Gatiss playing her husband. Um, and who it, it was, um, yeah, there, there was who else? Oh, who else was in it? Somebody's first job, and I, I'll try and remember by the end of the interview. Um, uh, and uh, uh it's um, yeah, so there were many of these. There was uh, uh Morecambe and Wise, and there was uh, Step to and Son, and lots of these kind of um, biographical pieces, and this one. Kind of, uh, I think the BBC, what they, it, it followed on from that. And I think what the BBC wanted to do was to try and find a way of reinventing the live audience sitcom, which was going so well with uh, Mrs. Brown's Boys, but wasn't everybody's, that show wasn't everybody's cup of tea. But, I mean, I remember the tickets for the live recording of Are You Being Served was sold out in about an hour. I mean, they just, everybody wanted, and on the recording night, it went absolutely ballistic. So the appetite was there, and I think it's, a, it's as much finding a way of rediscovering that genre, or whether that genre can exist. I and mean, it's very difficult to find comedy in, you know, what we call a multi-camera situation, where you've got lots of cameras, and it's almost like a stage uh, play. Um, yeah, and that just, yeah, that just sort of, um, uh, arrived and it was part of a stable of three or four. I don't know whether I would have done a series of it. I don't know that it, I, I like to think of it really as a tribute to that show. Uh, it was a lot of fun to make. Yeah, great. Because I'd grown up watching him and I think it was, uh, it, it, you know, there was, it was a slightly tricky area in some ways because well, this is, it's camp or it's, you know, it's not being. It's a kind of um, 
gay fest and his here he is and you know he's sort of camping it up and you know but i think at the time you know there was this one a gay man represented in an extremely he 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 was not the butt of the jokes he ran the jokes he ran it and we all i think know somebody who is uh, camp in that way in our in our i think of all our friends we'll know one or two that are camp and we love them and that's what it was about and it's not a you know it was it was a celebration of those kind of those kind of personalities irregardless of their sexuality uh, and so it was fun to play that wit and sharpness and i mean i remember recording it and when you record those shows you know they play them the music they play the you know the the soundtrack they pump it into the studio um <laughs> As the, you know, the lights, there's applause, and imp comes, ding, 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 ground floor. And I can remember my heart. I had the first line. My heart was literally pumping out. I could see my shirt pumping up and down. And because I was, but it was a real, real thrill, yeah. A, a, a testament to the performance you did. I thought what was very clever is you, you played Mr. Humphreys. You didn't play John Inman. You yeah. very much gave it your own. Yeah, I mean, it gave them a bit of a twist. Yeah, there was an element of, you know, I was, you know, it, it was a more organic process, I suppose, in a way. You just thought, how can I make this live in front of the cameras, in front of the cameras for the audience at home, and how can I make it live on the night? And it was, it probably came out of that. So there's, you know, there's a fair amount of impersonation, but not, I wasn't going to play, you know, I wanted to get, as I said, I wanted to play those characters that I've met in my life who are like that, who are camp and so funny and sharp and, you know, brilliant. And uh, so it was, it was kind of a crossbreed of those, I suppose. Okay. The last thing I'll say about are you being served before we, we move on. You're this a big is, fan, aren't you, Rachel? Like, <laughs> love you, Richard, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, but in a funny way, when, when an audience goes to see Hamlet, they're all sat there waiting for the two they are to be. Could you feel that from the audience in I've Been Served? They're all waiting for you to deliver that I one agree. line. Yeah, yeah, they were all waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, they, they were all waiting for it. And I think, oh, I'm trying to remember, but I think in the first couple of scenes, it, it, it could have happened. But I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we dived out of one, that you, you think almost went, and then he says something else, you know. So you kind of kept them hanging on. But yeah, you could sell it. It's Captain Peacock, wasn't it? John Chalice who gave the line and I think, yeah. And yeah, you just gave it the full, <laughs> gave it the full welly and it brought the house down, you know, it was great. It was, it was uh, as I said, the audience just adored it on the, on the night. So another classic, the reason why we're here today really, Doctor Who. Was yeah. That a, was that a programme you grew up watching? Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd, uh, I was behind the sofa and, you know, in, in, the, in the Cybermen. I mean, I remember the sort of, I remember being at, around the black and white stuff. I mean, in the, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I, it's on my Wikipedia, I, I was born in 66, but I'm born in 62. So I kind of, uh, I haven't changed it. I mean, somebody can please go ahead and do it. I haven't done that. Um, I like being, you know, my, I like being whatever I am now. Uh, and, uh, so uh, would, yeah, so I watched, I think the one, I mean, I'm trying to think of the doctors that really, you know. If you were born in 62, uh, I suppose uh, you'd have uh, been aware uh, of Patrick Trout. Sorry? Uh, if you were born in 62, I suppose you would have become aware of Patrick Trout and then into John Pertwee, really. It was John Pertwee, yeah. Patrick Trout was, this is a black and white, I must have been very young. Uh, but I remember John Pertwee, yeah, and that voice and... He had an ease about him, didn't he? And a kind of, uh, uh, he had a, he was very surprising and had uh, uh, an, an, an amount of sophistication perhaps as well. And, uh, uh, and he had these big massive shirts and collars and it was a good time to be the doctor, I think. And yeah, so I went through, through him and uh, uh, yeah, I, I very much enjoyed you know, tuning in and watching it with my family, yeah. So what did you make of Matt Smith as the Doctor when you were working alongside him? Well, Matt was tremendous, wasn't he? And I watched the episode because, I mean, it's a while ago since I did it. So I, I had a little look at it with my eight-year-old this morning. He said, oh, I don't want to watch it, Dad. You know, oh, I don't want to watch you doing stuff, you know. 
uh, and then he was hooked, you know, he started watching it and then got completely hooked in it and then got really concerned that I wasn't, you know, blown up at the end and what happened to me at the end, spoiler there. Uh, I imagine most of your viewers will have, uh, will have watched it. But, oh I mean, yeah, a few times. Yeah, and uh, so he, you know, he was, which is really interesting, isn't it, that an eight-year-old can be drawn into it and it's a really good one, you know, it's Neil Gaiman and so it's quality stuff. Um, and Matt was amazing. I mean, I have to say that I think when we shot that, certainly on a couple of days, it was towards the end of the series that we were shooting it. I'm not sure what, I think it was episode seven. Oh God, I'm going sh- oh, to shout, you're all shouting at me now. Um, but it was late, we filmed it late on. So they were triple banking. So they were doing three, epi- three different episodes in one day, I think, at one point, that you would be go a scene in one episode, go over, do another one, and then maybe a, maybe a voiceover in a third episode. I'm not sure whether you were doing in front of the camera for each of the three different episodes, but it was a very punishing schedule. And Matt had the kind of, uh, and Jenna, you know, obviously the workload is enormous, and he had the uh, kind of uh intelligence and talent to be able to pull that off uh consistently across the series so when i i know when i worked with him he was just fabulous yeah fabulous and where were you on location for the, the sort of fantasy castle that you were filming in we're in a castle <laughs> i think what i think i think we're in wales i mean uh i think we're in we were in barry island uh, near Barry Island, right? we were uh, filming in Cardiff, in the studios in Cardiff, the new studios in Cardiff, and I think we were we were in a castle somewhere. Some random castle. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's fair enough. Uh, now, when you get um, transformed into a, sort of a half Cyberman, um, what was the transformation process like for yourself? How long did you have to spend in the makeup chair to get that look? a fantastic uh, designer and uh, we took I think we took um, about an hour perhaps to get it right and I remember that there was the yeah it was getting the the patch and I think I mean I'd work I was trying to work out my contact lenses that was quite funny working out which one to put in which eye to try and get maximum uh, ability to be able to see and I think at one point we had a dark patch I said, this is silly, this grill is going to be driving me mad. But actually, we ended up having no, I think I had a patch over to try and be blind in that one. But I think it was seeing through the mesh like a fencer was uh, kind of what we, we needed. But yeah, there was a lot of work going on in getting all those kind of electroids into the face, making look as though they really were part of me. And it was a, it's a really good look. I thought it was a great idea having half Cyberman and a great creation. It's kind of, uh, rather dissolute, uh, rough around the edges, you know, down heel circus, you know, c- kind of guy in this trapped on the end of the universe. Such a great idea. But yeah, it took a while to get him, uh, uh, to get ready for it. Yeah, but it was, uh, it was fun, a lot of fun. Now, another guest actor on that, so on that show, on the, the Nightmare of Silver, was of course Warwick Davis. Yeah, yeah. How did you yeah. find working with him? He was great. He was, uh, and I've met him uh, subsequently as well, and, and we share a, a charity together as well, and, um, uh, the UK Sepsis Trust. And uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's great, great work. And what surprised me was how, and that sounds awful, you know, how, how, how good an actor he is. And I think... Uh, you know, he's got incredible abilities as an actor and he underplayed it beautifully. It was so natural. And, uh, uh, and I think that that was, that was really great to see. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, he's really got something. And uh, so, and I enjoyed his company as well. We had a, we had a laugh together. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. He was, he was great. Um, you say you enjoyed his company. Um, despite the fact that in one scene, you actually send him reeling with a kick. You kicked yeah. Warwick Davis. I, I kicked on, yeah, I kicked Warwick Davis to the feet of Matt Smith. That's uh, quite a boast, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, he didn't mind. We did it a few times. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I remember the elaborate sort of me kicking and then cut and then him landing in front of the 
camera on the uh, on a on a separate take. But I mean, I, he was. He, I mean, I'm sure if we asked him, he wouldn't have minded me actually kicking him, actually doing it. He well, kick me back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rematch. Yeah. Well, I can't let you go without talking to you about the the nativity movies, which yeah. have obviously been a great hit. But was that quite an, an unexpected hit? Uh, yeah, I mean, I done I done a, a film called uh, Confetti with uh, Debbie Isaac, who's the you know the right the creator, writer, director, and I really enjoyed that. So when this came along. Um, I think it was great. The idea was so good of having improvising it as confetti was. Uh, it was more structured, and you know, there's more of a storyline, uh, a clearer storyline, perhaps, and the structure. What the structure was there, but the real genius of it was to get the kids to improvise. And some the kids that could improvise were brilliant. The ones that couldn't, was, it was tricky, and you just got what you needed from it. But the ones that could could were just it was just gold dust. So <laughs> you know that was that was the thing that was the thing. I think when you watch it, particularly you know the first film, it's incredibly moving. And you know I think it's a real emotional roller coaster. And I think you can see, I mean, audiences are still watching. Generations of kids are watching it. I was in holiday in Italy a couple of years ago and. Uh, we went to get an ice cream in the piazza in this hill town in the middle of Italy and a family came out to me rushing out to us oh my god it's you and they'd driven from Bolton down to Italy in their camper van with the nativity films on a loop and they literally stopped playing it parked the car coming and there I was so you know they uh they're in incredibly endearing and uh and they're, they're very moving without being massively sentimental in a weird way. I mean, there's sentiment, but they're not sentimental, I don't think. Uh, and it's about families and parents and children and, you know, all that. So, yeah. So they've done three so far. Do you think there will be a fourth? And if there was, would you, would you be on board? I think, I think they've done four. I think Ooh, they've okay. done Nativity Rocks, uh, which I haven't done. And that answers your question. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think I'd done it by then. I think I was, uh, I think I'd covered that one. I could get all I could out of it. I mean, it's amazing that I did three. I mean, I think the third one, I mean, it, I said that there might even have been the second one I was doing The Lost Honor of Christopher Jeffries at the same time. I mean, that's the reason I didn't do so much in either the second or the third movie is, I think it was the third, because I was in the middle of, i just finished shooting it and, we couldn't do both, and so I just did a few days. But yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, kids, I love them. <laughs> As we're finding now in the lockdown, you love them, but there's a limit. Nativity <laughs> 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 film. Well, well, Jason, thank you so much for um, chatting to me this afternoon and giving up your time. Um, stay safe and well, and yeah, thank, thank you, you so very much. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah.